Hey there YouTube, this is SGM4306 back with another repair video. This time we're going to have more of an extended look at this uh, Rio Carbon that my friend Don had sent in uh, in a past mailbag video. Uh, he gave me two of these guys. The other one definitely does have some problems. I played around with both of them. The other one, it turns on, it looks like it'll work. But when I actually put even a known good um, microdrive in, even a known good microdrive with the correct firmware on, it re refuses to boot. And you can try to restore it with the computer, but um, it never successfully completes. This guy fully works, uh, with the exception of power switch broke off because these are surface mount right angle which is like the worst combination if you're going to do a right angle switch make sure it has like at least through hole posts to to take the uh the brunt of the force but anyway you could see uh don has very kindly included the switch too because that would be kind of difficult to track down that exact style switch that'll fit in there uh, without modification so we have the switch we have the unit itself should be good to go and he's also done the uh, the hard work for us, uh, shucking these guys, getting this open. Apparently you have to, well, you don't have to remove this front piece, but it makes it much easier. Because here you could see there are clips at the top and the bottom that you have to disengage, which are very difficult to do unless if you actually get into the unit so that you can uh, pry it from the front side. Anyway, we can see, yeah hard drive this obviously has a five gigabyte micro drive this is a mechanical hard disk i believe it's like 0.9 inch platter they're tiny i think i've done a teardown of one of these on a past video if not uh ask down below i have spare drives that are completely bushed so i could open them without worrying about destroying them because they're already destroyed anyway we have the battery here you can see a little thermistor for temperature sensing and yeah, that's about it that we can see from here. So this guy is already, you know, fully working. I've tested out. I've actually put music on here. Works great. So what we are going to do is uh, just disconnect the micro drive. And this is like a standard uh, compact flash interface. And you can actually do a compact flash mod on here. Uh, with the exception of uh, this will only work with very specific compact flash cards that are old and hard to get now uh, they're not expensive but they don't pop up all the time off ebay i have a search waiting so this can only take up to an eight gigabyte drive because the firmware i think it has like 24 bit addressing which means it can only read up to eight gigabytes so you can stick a larger card in here and if it does accept it and read it it'll still only be able to use eight gigabytes of it anywho so we should be able to just start unscrewing this. So two screws and a third screw. So I'm probably going to fix this, but keep the back off because it's going to be a pain removing it again uh, until I can find a compact flash card that can work with the mod. I believe from what I've read, people have had the most success with, what is it, SanDisk Ultra 2s? I think the uh, the 8 gigabyte, well, it'll work with any capacity below uh, 8 gigabytes. But yeah, like I said, you could stick a larger card in. Now, from what I read on forum posts, it's actually really interesting why this will only work with specific cards. Uh, it's because it uses a, a very specific sleep mode on these cards. So if the card doesn't support that sleep command when the board issues it when it goes to shut down it actually crashes it like locks up the card because it's an unsupported command so yeah that's the issue it'll it'll look like it's working with any card apparently from what i've read uh but yeah it, it <laughs> definitely has some issues still uh yeah the whole thing just starts to slide out and here we have the front and uh we can see already here i'm gonna be careful because this is still technically powered it's hard soldered i'd have to desolder it to to remove power which i will in a sec you can see a ram chip here the main processor sigmatel stmp uh 355db and we have some vc245a chips those probably are for the uh the interface these are probably like uh, some kind of parallel, serial parallel expander, port expanders, because there are two of them, they're identical, and they're right near the, um, the hard drive interface there. We can see some inductors, capacitor, that's for power stuff. 
Uh, there's actually a third chip, which is probably the exact same chip as these two, so I'm guessing it's using three of them. We have the side button here, which is identical to the power switch, and that's just for like the menu button on the unit itself. We have a rotary encoder here with the push in function, headphone jack, uh, mini USB that tells you the age of this. We have another button on the front here, and that's actually the reset button. And we have some more components. We have the, um, the microphone. This does record. There is a tiny little Atmel 433. Uh, it says uh, 24C512N. So that's a 512 megabit uh, serial, probably EEPROM or Flash. I don't, I don't know which one. But it's basically a serial memory chip. And that might be storing... Probably not the firmware, but possibly, yeah, because actually the firmware is loaded from the disk. Um, that's probably just storing, like, uh, local settings, that kind of stuff. We have the LCD, which is monochromatic, and backlit. Here's a backlight connector on that. Uh, some more power regulator stuff there. And we have the surface mount switches and LEDs. The neat thing is um, there's also another LED up top that uh, lights up the logo and the buttons and the screen when, when it's turned on. More power regulation here and screws that hold on this bracket, which we don't really need to remove. Well, we might need to, to gain access uh, to these pads, but eh, yeah, I think we're actually going to need to. I'm going to have to desolder the battery first, though. We can uh, remove this tiny little thermistor, which it uses to uh, prevent overcharging the battery or charging it while it's hot, which would be a very bad thing. So we should be able to, instead of peeling this whole thing off, just peel the thermistor off. What are you stuck to? Okay, there. So now we have the battery off enough that uh, we can start to desolder it. Now, negative is a lower one positive is the higher one uh that is really close to that bracket so i actually think i will just unscrew this bracket just so i don't have to worry about melting plastic melting and burning plastic which is not not fun keep in mind everything is still powered in this circuit technically even if it is reset uh so don't don't short anything pretty much Uh, yeah, as I drop the screw because that could uh, permanently damage some of the chips or all the chips or whatever. So yeah, here's that hard drive bracket and uh, I'm just going to set this down on this nice clean silicone mat surface. Fire up the soldering iron and uh, we're going to remove that I guess just to be safe. I'm going to remove this hard drive clip. It's just a zip connector and it slides out. Very similar to the the, um, the type of connector that the iPod Mini uses. Actually, in general, the design of this is you know very reminiscent of the iPod Mini because this is pretty much the competitor to the iPod Mini. Uh, though I don't believe these sold like nearly as well as the iPod Mini, so you know. Keep in mind the ground pin goes to a grounded plane so it might require a little more heat to to fully melt the solder so you can pull it off so the battery it's now defused just going to set that aside make sure nothing can short the pins there and uh, we're going to start to get ready oh yeah the main crystal oscillator is under this uh this emi shielding pad that's interesting yeah for the uh, main ic there i did not see that first time around anywho um let's just Grab this power switch. There we go. So the old power switch does actually click still. So it's mechanically good. Uh, doesn't look like... Oh, well, one of the legs is bent a little bit. Now these, you can't bend a lot. The metal will fatigue, and it, if it breaks off, then that switch is kaput. So you can see this one leg is bent a little bit. So I'm going to very carefully try and bend it back. 
maybe just with my finger. And this one as well. Sorry if you can't see this, this is really fiddly work. So just in terms of um, where it's going, let me just grab it with the tweezers. Goes right on here. You can see the four pads. These two are the uh, the ground like shielding pads, and then the two behind it are the actual signal pads that, uh, when you press the switch, it shorts those two together. So that's what sends a signal to the uh, the main chip that you press the power button. So, yeah, I'm going to be soldering this. I'm probably just going to add some flux and clean off the old solder. It's probably lead free. Uh, so here's the thing about lead-free solder. It has a higher melting point, and it's a little bit more brittle. Uh, leaded solder is a little bit more malleable. So mechanically speaking, for the most part, uh, leaded solder has better properties to um, stand up a little bit longer to, like, mechanical stressing, basically. Let's just get in there and put a little bit of liquid flux. And I'll just try to wipe the pads with my iron tip. Sorry if you really can't see this. Um, maybe I can zoom in. Yeah, without finding my microscope and setting that all up. Yeah, I think that's the best you're going to get. There. Okay. And I unfortunately also can't really find my uh, desoldering braid. So that's rather unfortunate. So otherwise I would just fully suck off all this solder and start fresh. But I think that's, that's pretty good. Okay, now I have to think about what angle am I going to be soldering this at. Um, I guess coming in from the right, so that means I have to hold it with my hold the actual switch with my left hand while I have the iron there so probably going to try and tack on the uh, the side ears there in the front the grounding pins and uh, get those situated and get it straight before I solder on the back pins because if you try to bend this once you have the back pin solder, those are pretty weak. They they don't will really won't withstand a lot of bending. Yeah, let's just uh, get some more flux on there for good luck. Just a puddle of it. Get a little tiny bit of solder on my tip. Hold this switch. and just sort of tack one end down. I can get in there. Okay, let's see. It's looking like eh, it's a little bit crooked. Now these front ears you can kind of bend easier and it's more or less fine. It'll withstand a little more force than the other, the rear legs. Looks like it's not quite sitting straight though. Sorry if this is hard to see, this is hard for me to see. Okay, so I have both front legs on. Looks like it is tilted a little bit, but I can, uh... oh, nope, one of the legs was not actually soldered on. So yeah, um, this is gonna take some finagling. Because the pads are very small and very hard to see. Yeah, 
here it might require heating up a few times okay and looks like we overcompensated and sort of bent it back a little bit too much there we go so now it's more or less straight and both pads look soldered so I'm gonna go ahead and solder the rear pads once again add a little bit of flux add a tiny bit of solder to my soldering iron tip and just go in there and reflow so one pad looks done second pad looks done so let's see pad in here is done pad in here is done might just reheat up both of these front pads to uh, make sure that the solder is nice and strong on those that also burns off the excess flux and yeah that looks good to me when I press the switch the body doesn't move but the switch does click in so yeah I think we are good to go on that now I'm just going to make sure that this window is clean. Okay, so we're going to zoom back out. There we go. And so we have to put this bracket back on. Okay, so these two screws are in now. No dust or anything on the screen, it looks like. So let me solder the battery now before I get in so I don't accidentally melt any plastic. <laughs> Actually, probably should have done that before I put the bracket in, but whatever. I'll work around it. Okay. This goes in like so. Probably want to put in the uh, ZIF connector for the CF card. Also realizing I should have done this before I put the bracket in because the bracket fouls with the connectors just slightly. But uh, yeah, it's it's doable. It's just would have been easier if I did it before. Three screws. Then we insert the card, reposition the battery, and we are home free. Hopefully I didn't kill anything. Insert the card, make sure it's aligned correctly, don't bend any of the pins, push straight in. Set it down. Just gonna momentarily just sort of... Uh, wait a minute. It goes in this way. And just see if the power button works. And she turns on. She's booting from the drive. I restored the Carbon Developer's Cut Edition, which is like a fan firmware. And yeah, she uh, booted up. Battery is... Uh, eh, I, I charged this like two weeks ago, and uh, I have used it a little bit, but I have a feeling the battery is kind of a bit old. So let's uh, turn it off. Power switch works perfectly. So that's a good one. We're just going to re-put this thermistor back onto the side of the battery uh, so that it can measure the temperature and there we go uh, that is a good one so if if this were all then you just slap this back on it would just clip back on oh there are actually additional clips here i forgot all along the side wow how many clips does this need <laughs> there's like clips all around the uh the uh drive cage and then ones on the top and the bottom Ugh. yeah this is Probably going to be annoying to get off. Not going to stick this back on. This is actually relatively clean. Uh, there's some slight denning on it, but yeah, I've seen iPod backs that are way more scratched than this. But obviously this took a cue from the iPod having that stainless steel back. But yeah, if you were done, you would just clip this back on and you'd be done. But because I want to eventually do the hard drive mod, I'm not going to do that just yet. Probably will do once I can 
grab a uh, eight gigabyte compact flash card uh, that will work with this guide, then I will uh, do a follow-up video on how to how to insert the card, how to reformat it, how to put the firmware back on, and uh, we should be good to go. But yeah, uh, this guy does boot up fully and uh, work now. Just look at that. You can see if I turn off the overhead lights, uh, the buttons do all light up red and the logo as well. And uh, the volume wheel, the scroll wheel on the side is a volume wheel. And that all seems to work. Let me just, so you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and the, this button on the side opens up the menu. You can go through etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's also a back button and I think if you was it if you press and hold or something no maybe not maybe I'm just insane anywho uh, I think if you press this button yeah then you can go to the now playing screen and manually select what you want to select and to turn it off you press and hold the power button so yeah that's just uh, generally a quick repair hopefully well <laughs> I say quick, and then I look at the timestamp, and we're already at 25 minutes. Anyway, hopefully, you guys, if you had a similar problem to this, this doesn't necessarily just apply to this model. Any device with a right angle surface mount power switch is vulnerable to breaking the power switch off. And as long as it doesn't lift the pads, it's pretty easy to repair. If it does lift the pads, then you'll have to find a way of, you know, using enamel wire to uh, connect to further up before the pad actually broke off and solder the the um, actual signal leads of the switch onto those points. Anyway, hopefully this was a pretty neat uh, look into what makes the Rio Carbon work and also how to repair that power switch. Uh, this will also apply to uh, this side button as well as is a uh, surface mount switch. Uh, might be a good idea actually to put a little bit of hot glue um, just behind this power switch to give it something so that um, when you press this button, it, you know, will keep the switch from moving backwards because that's what breaks this, um, these solder joints. If you keep, you know, flexing them back and forth over time, every time you press that power switch. Uh, so it might be a good idea to put a little something. Hot glue would be good because it's at least removable. Uh, if you want to make it permanent, you could put epoxy or something. But if anything breaks in that area, you'll have to destroy the board getting the epoxy out. So anyway, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.